Oh, there we go. Next time I'll know. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, welcome to our uh, uh, special Distinguished Visiting Lecture Grand Rounds uh, for the month of April. Um, it's a, an especial uh, personal pleasure for me today uh, to welcome our speaker, Dr. Joan Luby. Dr. Luby is the Samuel and May Ludwig Professor of Psychiatry, Child Psychiatry, and Director and Founder of the Early Emotional Development Program in the Department of Psychiatry at Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Luby uh, received her uh, A.B. in Poetry and Science, which I hadn't known, with oh. honors from Brown University, went on to do her M.D. at Wayne State University, uh, which is where I had also done my M.D., and then went on to do her uh, internship and residency and child fellowship training at Stanford uh, before taking a faculty position at Wash U. Joan and I actually uh, knew each other at Stanford. I was a research fellow when she came as a resident and had a chance to uh, develop a friendship and uh, do some great food experiences together. Uh, she was an incredible um, both cook and appreciator of, of great food and, and great wine. Um, and uh, although our paths went different ways as we, as we took off on our academic careers, I always um, kind of kept an eye on her career with, with great interest as she um, delved into a domain which at the time when she was um, kind of entering it, this idea of, of early childhood, what are the factors that shape development, particularly with emphasis on psych psychosocial factors, it was not a particularly fashionable area, certainly not in child psychiatry, which had a at that time and particularly at WashU, had a strongly uh, biological, uh, heavily biological bent, as if these were sort of two separate domains of study. Um, but there's another sort of personal connection with Joan, uh, which also has a lot of meaning to me, which is that when I was a medical student at, at Wayne State University, uh, my first, if you will, sort of attending or preceptor in psychiatry, the person who introduced me to the experience of what it was to be a psychiatrist was Joan's father, uh, Elliot Luby, uh, who was a very, himself a very prominent psychiatrist and was uh, chair of the program there. And uh, actually, through his interactions with me, was one of the first people to encourage me to consider psychiatry um, as my career option. So as I've said to Joan last night, I do hope you um, give my warmest regards to your father and, and uh, Leo, let him know that I'm, his, his, his reputation uh, continues to sort of live on and, and, and grow. Um, Joan was telling me that uh, her, her dad, Dr. Luby, is now 93 Three. and only recently stopped seeing patients, <laughs> and, but has still been working on a manuscript, <laughs> uh, which shows you what a phenomenal person that he is. Um, so I'm going to turn the podium over uh, to, to Dr. Luby, and uh, she will be speaking with us about her work in early adversity, early adversity, nurturance, and childhood brain development. This has been kind of her life passion. She has been really one of the pioneers in this area. Um, and we have time, um, quite a bit of time allotted at the end to have a discussion with her, to ask questions, to really engage in dialogue with her. Um, so I'm looking forward to a great morning with you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, it's such an honor and pleasure to be here, and I'm, you guys are very, you must be amazing if you attract Sophia from the Bay Area, and after a meeting with people this morning, I'm, I, I get it, I get why you came, because there is really a lot of interesting stuff going on here. So um, this is just the standard uh, conflict of interest slides. The research has been funded mostly by the NIMH and um, now by the um, WashU Developmental Research Center. Um, so the research that I'm going to present today is sort of based in certain fundamental principles, one being that um, in addition to genetic drivers, we now know that the brain is materially impacted by the psychosocial and physical environment. Um, this is particularly important to me as a clinician because, of course, this is an area that we can actually implement change in. Um, we know that adversity, stress, as well as stimulation and nurturance impact early brain development. We know this from animal models, and we know it increasingly in human models. 
One new domain that I'm going to talk about later in the lecture is this new frontier called the gut microbiome, where there's been a lot of interest in exploring the relationship between the microbial composition of the gut and how this influences the way the brain develops. This is an area that really brings together a number of areas of medicine um, and fundamentally cements sort of physical and mental disorders. Um, and there are emerging investigations of the relationship between the gut microbiome and mental disorders and behavioral outcomes. One of the reasons why I have always been drawn to early childhood mental health and infant mental health is because of my observed plasticity in kids who are this young. Um, it's the idea that they're rapidly developing, they're very changeable, interventions seem to impact them more powerfully. There's, of course, empirical evidence that suggests that's the case, too. And now we also know that this might be one of the underlying reasons for this might be increased plasticity of brain. So, um, and the idea of a sensitive period, which is well established in, in many domains in child development, and there's increasing interest of it in psychosocial or socio-emotional domains, is it's a period when the brain is more responsive um, and changes in response to the psychosocial environment, which is, which is why for us as mental health clinicians, it gives us a tremendous opportunity for intervention. So we know from very, very old animal work that the environment materially impacts brain development. And this is, you know, it's true that more traditional thinkers have often relied on the idea that the brain is fundamentally driven by genetic genetic factors, but we know from these models that when animals are exposed to different types of rearing environments, one of relative deprivation, one where there's some stimulation, and then the third what we might call a very enriched and stimulating environment, those animals who are reared in the enriched environment have more neurogenesis, bigger regions of brain, particularly the hippocampus, and the idea being that the, the, the stimulation is actually sort of feeding brain development. Um, we also know from animal work that the psychosocial environment, particularly the early relationship with the caregiver, is a key driver of epigenetic change. And this is the early work by Michael Meany, which is essentially shown, um, it, it, is, it is elaborated on the mechanism by which nature and nurture fundamentally come together. People always used to argue, is it nature and is it nurture? But of, of course, these things work in sync. So this work has shown that maternal nurturance impacts gene expression, which in turn impacts neuronal growth. Rat pups who experienced high maternal licking were better able to modulate their stress, had better hippocampuses, and in turn, they become more high nurturing nur uh, parents to their own offspring. So honestly, I can't think of a more important public health finding than this one. Um, somehow it hasn't gotten the traction in the public health that it needs to. But the idea is, in the model, um, rat moms who do a lot of licking are defined as highly nurturing. When they lick their rat pups, it actually causes demethylation of the DNA, which causes receptor proliferation and increased receptor um, development and enhanced development of the hippocampus, which makes those offspring better at emotion regulation and becoming more nurturing parents themselves. So to me, this is the solution to most problems of human nature. Um, so another issue that has come to light is the idea of biological embedding. And this is really the question of how exactly does the psychosocial environment impact our psychophysiology and our, and our biology? So biological embedding describes the process by which an initial transient homeostatic response to the environment a psychosocial stress, a, a, a good event, it starts to durably alter the physiology of the organism. This process is enhanced during sensitive periods. Um, that is, as I just described, sensitive periods are when the brain is particularly responsive to environmental stimuli. 
Um, and sensitive periods are well established in things like language development, some areas of cognitive development, but there are also sensitive periods in immune development and in metabolic and microbiome development. And this is where I'm going to talk about how these things come together importantly in early childhood. Um, this also, the epigenetic process that I just described, is another key feature of biological embedding. It's when the um, individual, the, the biological organism, animal, human, responds to the environment um, by changes in uh, neuronal, in DNA and gene expression, and, and therefore brain development. Um, epigenetic change is defined by stable, stable alteration of gene expression via mechanisms including attachment of chemical residues like methyl groups um, to DNA or molecules involved in, in packaging and transcriptional control. So it's really where um, the environment that the individual is embedded in actually changes their gene expression and their development. So we've had an opportunity to take a look at some of these issues in a longitudinal neuroimaging study that we've been um, working on at WashU with my collaborator Deanna Bart for almost 15 years. So this is a study that we started in 2002. We recruited children from the St. Louis community using a screening checklist that we developed called the Preschool Feelings Checklist. It literally takes two minutes to do. We administer it in pediatricians' offices, in daycares, and in preschools, and then we oversampled children who had high levels of depressive symptoms. We also included kids who had zero on the checklist as our healthy controls, and then a number of children with other psychiatric disorders also slipped through. We had an initial sample of 306 children. The idea, the initial sort of intent of the study was to address the question of whether children between the ages of three and six could get a clinical depressive syndrome, whether this depressive syndrome um, had symptoms that sort of clung together in a, in a constellation similar to what's described in the DSM-4, whether it showed discriminant validity from other psychiatric disorders that arise in young kids, like disruptive disorders, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorders. And then importantly, we looked at a bunch of um, biological variables as well. For example, we looked at stress uh, cortisol reactivity, we found very similar alterations in stress cortisol reactivity in these depressed preschoolers. We also followed them over time for the first five-year period to take a look at the trajectory of development. And what we found is that these kids with this preschool depressive syndrome, which is basically the DSM-5 symptoms of depression without the two-week uh, criterion um, applied, um, they went on to have relapses, re recovery and relapses and recurrences of depression or showed homotypic continuity. So when you had this depressive syndrome, you, were, you didn't just grow out of it and have a healthy trajectory for the most part. You didn't become someone who later had ADHD or a different disorder. You had the highest risk of having a recovery and then a relapse for a later episode of depression. So to us, this suggested that depression could be identified as early as age three, that it was fundamentally the same disorder that we see in older children, adolescents, and adults. Um, and that um, we might want to capture it early for all of the reasons that I just described. Um, at the second phase of funding was when I began collaborating with the rich neuroscience community at WashU, and um, I got Deanna Barch into the game. I did have to twist her arm a little bit to be willing to scan kids this young, but we started doing brain scans on these kids as we followed them across development, and we're looking, of course, at we did psychiatric interviews every time they came in. We collected a lot of observational data on these kids, looking at measures of temperament. We looked at parent-child interaction, et cetera. So we've been able to address, I mean, even though the purpose of the study was really to look at the trajectory of early onset depression and to look at the impact of early onset depression on brain change across development, we've had an opportunity to look at lots of other things, particularly 
early experiences of psychosocial adversity. Of course, we initially were using those variables as control variables because we thought, well, we need to control income to needs or we need to control exposure to adversity. The problem was they had such a loud signal in the sample that we realized we had to follow that as well. So that's why the sample has ended up being very informative for things like the impact of ACEs and adversity and exposure to poverty on brain development. Um, so one of the early findings out of this study sample that we ascertained just from scan one was um, this question whether early support in early maternal support or caregiver support, I always use the word maternal support, something like 95% of the caregivers in our sample are mothers, but it's really primary caregiver that we're targeting. Um, whether caregiver support influenced the development of the hippocampus in this human sample, similar to what I showed you in the MENI epigenetic model. And basically what we found is that our observed measure of caregiver support, so this wasn't mothers rating their own behaviors, this was blind raters observing mothers' behaviors under a mildly stressful condition with the caregiver. And those children who experienced more maternal support had larger hippocampal volumes at school age. That effect is somewhat diminished in the depressed kids, um, and it's mostly happening in the healthy kids. But it's a, it's a parallel finding in humans similar to what's been well established in animal models. Again, suggesting the importance, um, the salience of maternal support in this trajectory of brain development. So many other people in the literature have actually taken a look at more recently, I'd say in the, about the last 10 years, there has been an increasing literature looking at exposure to poverty and other forms of adversity and its impact on brain development. And there's converging literature basically showing that children reared in poverty have non-optimal brain developmental trajectories. So that kids who are exposed, who are reared in high, in, in well-resourced environments, um, high income to needs, have much bigger brain volumes, steeper trajectories of brain growth. Children in low SES environments have, have um, blunted trajectories of, of gray matter growth. We also took a look at this in the study sample that I just showed you and basically found that there was an important relationship between income to needs, which is of course how the federal government defines poverty. In other words, how, me, how much income is coming in from all sources and who's living off of this income, um, and hippocampal volume. Now, again, many other groups, several groups have shown that um, and in fact, it's important to say that this idea of exposure to poverty and poor child developmental outcomes is not new news. We've known this for 20 or 30 years. The single most powerful predictor of poor child developmental outcomes is exposure to poverty without a doubt. But this also speaks to the power of neuroscience to impact um, public health, once these studies started showing it impacted brain development, it seemed to change the argument a little bit. What was new about this particular study is we showed that this effect was mediated through supportive parenting. So those children who were reared in um, low SES conditions who had supportive parents had better hippocampal outcomes, suggesting that's one of the factors that's key to the non-optimal brain developmental trajectory. It also gives us a place to focus our intervention energies as opposed to trying to address the problem of poverty more generally. Did you want to ask a question? Sure. People always ask that question. Yeah, yeah. Um, we didn't actually, we, don't, we didn't really measure nutrition, um, but many people have looked at that and, and have controlled for nutrition and still see this effect of poverty on brain development. Yep. So um, the other thing we also became interested in is this related variable, a variable that's related to poverty, um, 
called ACEs, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, adverse childhood life experiences. Um, and when I present this data to my very, very biological department, I actually have to sort of introduce them to this idea because it's a new idea to my department. But of course, this study was done in the late 90s, and this is the famous study that took this very large sample, almost 10,000 people. It's a retrospective study, but what they found um, was really kind of a, um, an earthquake in, in developmental model, I mean, in, in medical models, in that they basically found that people who are, ex who are exposed to ACEs in childhood have much higher rates of life-threatening medical illnesses than people who don't. So people who had high ACEs, it increased their rates of cancer, it increased their rates of cardiac events, it increased their rates of lung disease, liver disease, major causes of death providing a link for the first time of this idea of psychosocial adversity actually impacting health. Now, when this study was first published, granted it has some limitations because it is retrospective, but it's a pretty powerful effect that they found. Um, this study was published. It really didn't get that much attention, actually. I mean, it wasn't widely accepted. Since that time, people have done prospective studies and confirmed this effect. People have looked at this effect effect in animal models, and it's now become a clearly widely accepted phenomenon. So based on this literature, what we wanted to look at in the study sample that we've been following in St. Louis is this question, since we found this big effect of poverty, and poverty of course is highly correlated with ACEs, we wanted to take a look at the effect of ACEs on brain development in our study sample. And one of the questions that we're really trying to get at is this question of mechanisms. How does exposure to adversity early in life when your brain is developing, how might that mechanistically result in these poor health outcomes? We also know from epidemiologic literature that high ACEs is a very significant driver of, psyche, of access one psychiatric disorders as well. So we know that produces both poor mental and physical health outcomes. And the question is, how mechanistically exactly does it do that? Now, we can't look at it in all domains in this particular study, but we do have these very good markers of brain development across time. So one of the things we wanted to take a look at is how ACEs impacted the development of the brain. We were particularly focused on the prefrontal cortex because there's been a lot of literature showing a relationship between ACEs and the prefrontal cortex. We wanted to see how that might then impact emotions or behaviors, and then how that might lead to poor physical health or emotional health outcomes. So basically what we did is we first modeled um, all the different regions of the prefrontal cortex. Um, and we wanted to see um, whether, whether there was any particular reason, region that ACEs had a big effect on. And what we found is that the inferior frontal gyrus was the one region that popped out as very significantly impacted by ACEs and the only one that survives a multiple comparison test. Now, ACEs in this study sample is provided, is, is defined by exposure to poverty early in childhood, typically exposures to traumas, um, having a parent with a major medical uh, mental illness, including substance abuse, and also parental a trauma, um, parental incarceration, and things like that would be would be uh, coded as a trauma. So once we found the inferior frontal gyrus, we started to wonder what exactly does the inferior frontal gyrus do? I'm always teasing my neuroscience colleagues that we really know so little about what the brain actually does. I mean, there's lots and lots of studies showing the inferior frontal gyrus is highly involved in inhibitory control. It comes up on go, no go types of tasks. It's, it's, it's a stop signal inhibition. Um, clearly, it, it's related to that. It's also involved in emotion regulatory circuits. Circuits. It's involved in reappraisal of social emotions. It's involved in emotional learning. And then it has some roles in semantic and phonological processing. 
So what we see is that the more experiences of ACEs you have, the smaller your inferior frontal gyrus was at scan one. Scan one um, was conducted when the kids were sort of early school age. Then we have a model um, where we basically, this is actually something we submitted and is currently under review, where we see that ACEs influences the volume of the inferior frontal gyrus. That in turn influences emotional awareness using a child report measure of emotional awareness. And that in turn impacts depression severity at scan three. So this is a longitudinal model. ACEs is measured early. Inferior frontal gyrus is measured at scan two, scan one. Poor emotional awareness is measured after that. And MDD severity is measured after that. So we have essentially a sequential mediation model showing sort of adversity impacting brain, that impacting emotional functioning, and that leading to increased depression severity. Importantly, that model holds when we control for gender, when we control for whole brain volume, when we control for age, when we control for general physical health, and I'll tell you why we did that in a minute, and also when we control for prior depression severity. So it's, it's, it's clearly something that's acting over and above your risk for depression based on earlier depression. Um, we also looked at a very, very similar model looking at general physical health outcomes, which we did, of course, following this Folletti et al. And, and that related literature, and basically found something very similar. This model isn't quite as robust as the last model, but it is significant, and it's also a sequential mediation model. So again, the experience of early adversity in childhood, that defined by poverty, trauma, having a mentally ill parent, and it being exposed to poverty, is related to having a smaller inferior frontal gyrus. That's related to having poor emotional awareness, that then puts you at risk for more physical health problems in adolescence. So a couple of things are interesting about this model. One is that it's linking emotional competence to health outcomes. We actually have several other published um, papers from our data set that link emotional competence to health outcomes um, or to things like BMI. For example, that's a little bit less of a stretch. Um, the other thing that's interesting about it is we're finding poor physical health outcomes as early as adolescence, when prior studies that have been done have actually been dealing with you know, older adults when our risk for poor health, health, health outcomes is much higher. So it suggests this trajectory is already operating earlier in development. That holds when we control for age, when we control for gender, of course, whole brain volume, and also depression severity. So it's clearly, um, there's a similar trajectory in the two negative health outcome pathways through brain and emotion functioning. Did you have a question? Yeah. So, so the best design with that would be like a twin study, for example, yeah. that would give you the definitive. Um, so, right. You could look at monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins. Um, whether you can see differences in being exposed to poverty, and that'd be a hard study to do. I don't know of anyone who's done that. Okay. We don't have anyone do you? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's, that's a very good point. That, it's a very good, good point, and people have raised that point, and you're absolutely right. It's possible hippocampal volume is heritable, and that, you know, p parents who have bigger hippocampuses are more nurturing, and what, yeah, that's true. I cannot rule that out, and we haven't scanned the parents. Well, I mean, you could do so. We could. We could. We'd like to. We just need, we need money to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay.
Um, so just showing sort of more data along the same line, um, a paper that was published in the American Journal by my colleague Deanna Barch was one of the first ones to actually take a look at the impact. Well, there have been many papers that I just mentioned that have looked at the impact of poverty on brain structure, all of which converging data showing hippocampus, changes in um, amygdala, and some prefrontal areas as well. But connectivity has been less well explored. So in the study sample that I just showed you, um, Deanna looked at connectivity between the amygdala, the hippocampus, and prefrontal regions, um, basically. And those are sort of mapped out right here. So basically, uh, emotion regulatory con connectivity of emotion regulatory control regions. What she looked at is whether exposure to poverty impacts connectivity of brain and whether that is related to depression severity later. And she basically found that there was um, a mediating, a full mediation taking place. So in other words, exposure to poverty early in life impacts connectivity between hippocampus, amygdala, and prefrontal regions. And that altered connectivity mediates the relationship between income to needs and depression severity. So suggesting that these adversities not only impact brain structure, but that they also impact brain connectivity um, and therefore change the way the brain is wired or uh, um, that, it, that regions communicate with each other. The other thing that we took a look at, um, I've talked a little, you know, I've been focusing a lot about how early experience changes brain development. So it sort of thinks about the brain more instead of a genetically predetermined organism, but more like a plant that is, you know, sensitive to how much light, fertilizer, and water that it gets, um, which stands to reason that humans are like that. Um, so the data that I've shown you so far, you know, strongly suggests this link between early experiences and the way the brain develops. The other thing we were interested in, and a lot of these um, findings are engineered with the main underlying purpose of getting the public to, to recognize and underscore the importance of early childhood depression. At least that's what, that's what's driving my publications. So in order to, do that further, we wanted to ask the question of what does the experience of depression in early childhood, does that have any impact on the later trajectory of brain development? Because if we can show that that has an impact on the way the brain then later grows and develops, that actually means we can't ignore it anymore. So what we did is we did, um, using all three scan waves now, we did multi-level modeling where we basically derived a mean depression severity score using a composite of this clinical interview that we have, which is kind of like the case ads, but it's, it's adapted for young children, over several waves of early childhood. And we come up with a composite sort of mean exposure to early childhood depression that looks at both number of episodes and it looks at intensity. And then we wanted to see how does that impact brain development over the three scan waves that basically span middle childhood to early adolescence. So we were looking at, at gray matter. And what we know about gray matter, just in terms of normative brain development, is that gray matter is increasing in volume as there's neurogenesis until around early adolescence when it reaches a peak late school age, early adolescence. And then it starts to thin and volume starts to decrease, decrease through this process of pruning, making more, the brain more efficient. Um, now, there's several disorders where there are changes in cortical gray matter volume and thickness related to psychiatric disorders. For example, widespread reductions in gray matter volume and thickness have been found in adult depression. Widespread cortical thinning was reported in the high-risk offspring of depressed relatives um, in Myrna Weissman's multi-generational sample. Cortical thinning has been detected in childhood onset schizophrenia. And then um, 
Phil Shaw showed this really interesting finding of delays in cortical maturation related to ADHD. So we know cortical maturation is important for psychiatric manifestations. I didn't hear the question. Cortical gray matter. So it's overall gray matter throughout the whole cortex. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we took a look at was at basically a multi-level model that looked at this, 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 this relationship of early depression severity to cortical gray matter volume change over time. And what we see is that depending on how much depression you experienced in early childhood, the trajectory of your cortical gray matter change is different. And that is true even when we control for age, when we control for gender, when we control for income to needs, and when we control for IQ. So we, we feel pretty confident that it's related to this early childhood depression severity. So basically what we see is that children who had high levels of depression in early childhood have a much steeper drop-off in cortical gray matter compared to those who had low me measures of um, early childhood depression. And the same is true for cortical thickness, so cortical volume and cortical thickness. So there's a change in, in these parameters across three waves of scans that span middle childhood to early adolescence. So the way we've interpreted these findings is that we think early childhood depression experience is associated with a change in the trajectory of cortical gray matter volume and cortical gray matter thickness. Of course, there is the related question, is this an experience-based phenomenon or could this be related to genetic predisposition? And here, we took a look at family history because we also do a family interview for genetic studies in all of these subjects, and we found no effect of family history of depression driving these trajectories and no effect of other psychosocial stressors driving these trajectories. So while that's only a twin design would give, or a genetic design would give us that definitive information, it really looks like it's not related to that. Okay, so the other thing we also wanted to look at is the question of, I already showed you earlier how children who experienced increased maternal support during the preschool period had larger hippocampal volumes at school age. Now that we've collected these three waves of scans, we then wanted to see, is that just a one-time phenomenon? How does this change as we look at hippocampal volume across um, school age and early adolescence? So what we know about the normative development of the hippocampus is that it's basically increasing in volume and sort of plateaus um, in middle childhood. You don't see the same type of pruning and volume decline. Um, we found that maternal support not only impacted hippocampal volume at scan one, but maternal support experienced during the preschool period impacts the trajectory of change in hippocampal volume across the three scan waves. So again, underscoring the importance of this basic sort of foundational building block, block of human development, that is caregiver support. Um, so we controlled for another, a bunch of other of the usual suspects. We wondered whether income to needs has an effect. It has an effect on volume, but it doesn't affect volume change over time. IQ has an effect on volume of the hippocampus and a near significant effect on volume of change, on change over time. Gender has an effect on volume as it always does, but no effect on volume over time. We also wanted to see whether later childhood maternal support had an effect on volume. It had an effect on volume, but not an effect on volume over time. So again, these are what the multi-level models give us, basically showing that when you have a more supportive caregiver, you have a much steeper increase in hypo hippocampal volume across school age and early adolescence compared to the blue line, who are the kids who have the least maternal support. So sort of suggesting maternal support provides the food for hippocampal volume growth, very similar to what we saw in the animal model. Do you have a question out there? Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it translates into something like a 10% change. I don't know about number of neurons, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, 8, eight to 10%. Yep. Sure. Yep. That's okay. Well, I mean, so I'm not, I'm not a statistician, but the multi-level model addresses that issue. It, it, it literally addresses whether it controls for the intercept and slope. So it's definitely not just scan one. It's definitely change over time. And I'm not exactly sure how multi-level. Yeah. Yeah, that may be true. That may be true. Right. Yeah, I don't know that it can tell us how the change over time changes with time. I'm not aware of a, of a parameter that, that can look at that in these multi-level models. There might be such a thing. Yes? Pretty sure there are. I, I, no, I don't know actually. I don't know if they've if they've done animal studies where they, because they you know when they do animal studies they don't scan the animals they sacrifice them and look at their hippocampus. So I don't know that there have been longitudinal studies with animals. That's an interesting idea. I mean people are getting more interested in scanning animals, um, but I don't think that's that technology is a hundred percent there just yet. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I'm going to show you, we do have a sense of that, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that later, because that, that's a really good question. So, you know, people always get really excited when there's brain change, but what exactly does that mean in terms of behavior? Um, and we actually do see that this has a meaning in terms of behavior, which I'll show you, I hope, in a minute. I think it's in here. Ah, here's my next slide. Why do hippocampal growth slopes matter? Well, um, the, be, because the kids who have a, a more optimal hippocampal growth slope also have better emotional functioning. They have better sadness dysregulation, and they have less rumination when we look at them after scan three. So it suggests that a more optimal sort of hippocampal growth trajectory then predicts more optimal emotional functioning. So we do think it matters. Yes? How did you measure maternal support from taking a little baby animal? Yeah. No, that's a really good question. And because of that, we invested lots of energy into measuring maternal support. So what we did is we had parents and children, when they were preschoolers at, at um, baseline, come into the lab. We observed them. We used an observational paradigm. Um, uh, it was a task called, um, it, it's a gift where there's an attractively wrapped gift on the table. The mother is given a stack of questionnaires to fill out. The child is in the room and they're told this gift is for them, but they can't open it until mom is done filling out these questionnaires. <laughs> it's sort of like what you experience at 6 o'clock at night when you're cooking dinner with your 3-year-old. Um, and so we coded exactly how the mom dealt with that challenge, because of course the kids are all getting very impatient, and how supportive, lack of supportive, or punitive was the mom. So we're pretty confident in our, in our sup maternal support measure. Okay, so the other thing we wanted to ask is, is there a sensitive period for the effect of maternal support on hippocampal volume change? And because we also measured maternal support using a similar observational age-adapted paradigm when the kids were school age, um, we were able to measure that. So we again looked at a multi-level model where we account for maternal support later, and we basically find that there is, there seems to be a sensitive period, that maternal support experienced earlier in life is having a bigger effect 
on hippocampal volume change than maternal support experienced later in life. And we do have enough variance here where some kids who experienced high maternal support at one stage and low at another and vice versa to be able to address this question. Suggesting that maternal support during early childhood may have a more important sort of enhancing effect on brain development than later maternal support. And then this is just, um, because the multi-level models are sort of hard to interpret, this is just an ANOVA that uses all of the data showing the difference. So this first graph um, shows differences in maternal support experience during the preschool period. So you can see the blue line, low maternal support, that's what their hippocampal trajectory looks like. The yellow line, the highest maternal support. And then the next, the one on the your, your right, is um, school-age maternal support, which you can see doesn't separate the graphs nearly as much. Okay, so the conclusions here are that poverty and early life adversity negatively impacts neurodevelopment. Early experiences of depression negatively impact neurodevelopment. There may be sensitive periods for these effects. Next question really is, how early in life can these effects be detected and therefore prevented? And importantly, what is the mechanism of these effects? Um, we know from recently published data that the effects of poverty on brain development can be detected as early as one month of age. This is a study out of UPenn with a sample of about 100 African-American infants showing that infants reared in poverty already have different have suboptimal cortical gray matter as early as one month of age. Um, so based on the idea that this, these mechanisms are occurring and they actually are operating very, very early in life, we, we have launched a new study um, that, is take, that is utilizing a sample of 1,000 pregnant women that are currently being studied at Washington University for a study of premature birth funded by the March of Dimes. These 1,000 women are going to be studied in each trimester of pregnancy. We're coming in and we're measuring psychosocial stress and adversity during each trimester of pregnancy. We're also measuring cytokines or inflammatory markers in the moms. And then we'll be doing brain scanning of the babies at birth and then following the kids up to age three. This is where all of these different factors are coming together. So we're looking at the effects of psychosocial stress on development of the fetus and brain development. We're also looking at the effects of inflammatory processes on brain development. I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute. And then we're studying the development of the infant and young child's gut microbiome to look at how that may impact brain change as well. And inflammation and the gut microbiome are also related. So this is a study that's really trying to drill down on the mechanisms by which the, the biological embedding fundamentally. So the other thing that we know about inflammatory markers that have been described by many people, but in particular two health psychologists at Northwestern, Greg Miller and Edith Chen, is that inflammatory markers have a very similar type of profile to what I've just described with maternal support and brain development. People who experience psychosocial adversity and poverty basically have an altered inflammatory state. These individuals have developed what's called a pro-inflammatory phenotype. So in other words, they experience lots of stress in their environments, and their inflammatory markers are upregulated, they become aggressive, and they are resistant to inhib inhibitory signals. So these people walk around with high levels of low-grade inflammation. We think that might be one of the mechanisms by which adversity is increasing vulnerability to health problems. Um, Miller and Chen have described basically that experiencing adversity actually has an impact on monocytes and macrophages that then have strong inflammatory tendencies. Those actually impact 
hormone systems, neurotransmitter systems in brain that also then has an effect on behavior and makes individuals who experience that adversity have more risk-taking behavior, make poorer health decisions, and they see this as part of the pathway by which adversity impacts health. Um, they've also shown that similar to brain development, maternal warmth impacts the pro-inflammatory phenotype, that children who are exposed to high maternal warmth have lower cytokines, lower inflammation, compared to children who are exposed to low maternal warmth, so operating in parallel to this brain mechanism. Now, in a different area of focus, there's the gut microbiome, which has really only, I think, been discovered and described maybe over the last 10 years. Um, it was discovered that humans have this highly adaptable microbial um, organ in the gut. We know most of the studies have focused on the role of the gut microbiome in malnutrition and growth. We know that this microbiome is critical to the biotransformation of food and energy. But we also know it plays a role in neurodevelopment through the gut-brain axis. Interestingly, and the reason why it's important to someone like me, is because it's formed during the first two to three years of life and shortly after birth. So it's an early childhood when the microbiome gets formed, and importantly, it also is sensitive to a variety of environmental exposures. We know from a number of animal and human studies, there's increasing interest, all this is a young, young literature, suggesting that the microbiome actually has an effect on behavior. It has an effect on behaviors like anxiety and depression. It has some of these effects in animal models, so much so that you know, people have suggested um, using um, probiotics for the treatment of mental disorders. We, all, we know about the gut-brain axis and, and the relationship between the gut and how, how the gut impacts the brain, first because there's a direct connection through the vagus nerve, secondly because it impacts the, cir the, the circulatory system, and it is where many neurotransmitters, including serotonin, are, are born, basically, and it also impacts the immune system. Um, and then this is just sort of further evidence of the microbiome and neuroimmune function. And many people have started to map out some of these pathways. So, so basically what I'm, what I'm talking about is adversity, its impact on immune systems, its impact on the gut microbiome, and how that might influence the brain development. That's fundamentally what we're trying to study. What's important here is that we also know that the environment has a material effect on the infant gut microbiome. Um, babies who are born to stressed mothers have different compositions of their gut microbiome, whether you're breastfed or bottle fed changes the composition, whether you've been a cesarean or a vaginal birth, and of course, whether you've taken antibiotics and the kinds of things that you eat. So again, all of these converging factors that, that are sensitive to the environment, and they're sensitive to the environment early in life. So it suggests the gut microbiome could be one of the missing links between the relationship between early life adversity and neurodevelopmental disorders. Micro, there's microbial control of neurofunction by activating the immune system. The microbiome exerts an influence on the regulation of neurotransmitters, and it influences amino acid composition in brain and metabolism. And again, there's this evidence for this sensitive period, which underscores why early childhood is such an important time. So this is just a slide that sort of shows you the overlap of sort of very steep increases in brain development overlapping with this early sensitive period when the gut microbiota assembles. And then, again, Miller and Chen and others have come up with this neuroimmune network hypothesis suggesting that the pro-inflammatory phenotype has an influence on brain, which then influences um, risky health behaviors. So the implications of this for risk and prevention of mental illness, one, it underscores the importance of early identification of risk to capture enhanced plasticity or sensitive periods. It harnesses the idea of experience-dependent neuroplasticity, that is brain change that's sensitive to psychosocial and environmental factors, and the idea that enhancing stimulation and nurturance during early sensitive periods of affective and cognitive 
development may be where we should focus some of our intervention targets. Now, obviously, the study I've shown you about the relationship between neuroimmune systems, the microbiome, and brain development has just been launched, and we don't, we'll be able to look at it prospectively. There's lots of speculation and data pulled from other areas suggesting those things are acting together, but we don't know exactly how. Um, we do know that interventions, psychosocial interventions, also impact brain development. And this is a study um, that was published in JAMA Pediatrics maybe six months ago that was looking at um, a sample of adolescents who were exposed to poverty, and it looked at their brain development, and it basically showed that those who underwent a parent-child psychotherapy had more optimal brain development than than kids who were living in poverty who didn't have the psychotherapy. So suggesting that actual psychosocial interventions can impact neurodevelopment. Um, so how do we want to harness this, um, particularly in the area of depression, which is where we've been focused? So I told you earlier in the lecture that we do think depression can arise as early as age three. We know this is associated with alterations in the structure and the function of brain. Um, I showed you that from our longitudinal study. There have been some studies that have actually scanned depressed preschoolers showing functional alterations similar to alterations known in depressed adults. We know that depression is a disorder that has both genetic and psychosocial factors, and we know psychosocial factors influence brain development, particularly during sensitive periods. So what we've tried to do is develop an early psychosocial intervention that targets the parent-child relationship, focuses on emotion development, and is sort of conceptualized as an early intervention for depression. And what we did is we modified a very well-validated parent-child therapy called PCIT, developed in the mid-'70s by Sheila Eiberg, and that has been very well-tested, shown to have powerful effect sizes above 1.0, and shown to produce enduring change six years later when people had no booster sessions. So because that was so te well-tested, we launched on that, utilizing the techniques of that therapy, and added on a piece that we thought was specific to depression that focused on emotion development. The therapy is different than other forms of standard psychotherapy because A, it sees the dyad together, but B, more importantly than that, it uses live coaching. So the parent wears a bug in the ear, the therapist watches them across a two-way mirror, and coaches the parent and child through hot, dysregulated emotion states, which we induce. Um, using emotionally evocative events in vivo. This is just what the setup looks like. Um, we're currently testing, we're almost at the end of the trial, where we're doing, we're seeing kids at baseline. When they meet criteria for depression, they either get immediate treatment or they go to a waitlist control. Importantly, we are getting EEG or ERP is at baseline, which we're getting with great success. FMRIs we're trying to get without as good success. Um, we also do an ERP midway through, and we do an ERP and try to get an FMRI at the end of treatment to compare not only symptom change, but neural correlates of change throughout the course of treatment. And then this is just, the, the use of EEGs in these young kids is just phenomenal. A, it's so much more, um, more pragmatic. The kids tolerate it beautifully. It's much less expensive. And when you want to study young kids, the data capture is so much higher. I mean, the problem is it doesn't get at subcortical structures. The advantage is it gets better. It, it, it captures timing better. So it's, it's, I've been very, very excited about this, as have many of my colleagues. Um, so conclusions and next steps overall. Poverty and other physical and psychosocial experiences predict brain volumes, whole brain as well as hippocampus. Poverty and likely other psychosocial experiences predict functional brain connectivity in regions thought to be critical for emotion regulation. Maternal support mediates the effects of poverty on brain volume, and there's evidence that psychosocial intervention alters this pathway. There's now studies being done on the idea of giving people 
income who live in poverty and seeing how this changes child development, using educational augmentation, family support, but I think parent-child interventions are probably the best. Um, this is you know, one of the most important slides I'll show. This is actually um, a study that was published by Nobel Prize winning economist James Heckman, who basically did an economic analysis of interventions across childhood and sort of asked the question, for investment on the dollar, if you invest in an intervention when the child's very young, how much payoff do you get compared to investing on the intervention when the child is older? And you can see investing in the preschool period is like investing in a, in a bullish stock market. You get much bigger gain on the dollar. This is sort of the view from 30,000 feet, which we suspect is related to the underlying neuroplasticity. Okay, so of course this is this is a very collaborative endeavor. I couldn't have done any of it without my partner in crime and all matters of the brain, Deanna Barch, um, who's been you know oversees all of the um, neuroimaging and all the neuroscience elements, and then the collaborators on the gut microbiome and neuroinflammatory study that we've just launched come from immunology and GI, and so it's, it's truly multidisciplinary, which if you can find the right personalities, works really well together because there's nothing to argue about because everybody has very different expertise. Um, and then we have a group of postdocs from a T32 um, program that we have, many of whom are studying related areas, early onset anxiety disorders, et cetera. Okay, so I'm open for questions. The development of the blood-brain barrier? Well, right. That's true. I mean, we do know that the microbiome incre it, it, it changes the permeability of the blood-brain barrier, and it makes the blood-brain barrier more permeable. But I don't know the answer to when it's complete. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure the answer to that. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So the IFG, the function of the IFG, I mean, it's, it's, it's received a lot of attention for impulse control and sort of, you know, that executive sort of stop signal type of action. But when you dig a little deeper in the literature, because you're searching for something to make sense of your findings, you do see that it is also plays a role in emotion regulatory processes and sort of reappraisal, for example. So if that were smaller, you might have less capacities in that domain and therefore be less emotionally competent in your interactions with the world leading to symptoms of depression. That's kind of how I see it. Yes. Mm -hmm. say under six, mm -hmm. there's um, the feature of more irritability that can be almost like a trait, temperament irritability, versus an episodic depression that's more time variable, and especially early childhood, we're running into that issue. And in that same piece of it, given that I studied with neurodevelopmental disorders that are early, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, let me ask you the second one first because that's the easier one to address. So of course we do a comprehensive psychiatric interview and you're of course, as you're right, as is so typical in child populations, there is a lot of comorbidity. So maybe 40% of the depressed kids also have ADHD. And we, we do control for comorbidity. So we're always, so if that's, if that's contributing to the signal, we're controlling for it if we're making any conclusions about depression per se. Um, so we, we do control for it and we can account for it. The first question about the state trait, of course, is trickier. I mean, I will say we didn't really try to address that because the interview that we used doesn't measure sort of onsets and offsets. We now use the KSATs, which does a better job of measuring that. Um, I will say that in the treatment study I'm doing, we're clearly seeing kids who have episodic depression. It'll be like a new onset, you know, change from previous functioning. On the other hand, we also see kids who, these might be traits that they've been carrying with them, but nonetheless, they've now crossed the clinical threshold. Um, so you can't just have irritability to meet the criteria. You also have to have sleep disturbance, guilt. Um, you know, you might have suicidal ideation, which, by the way, we're also seeing quite a bit of in this sample. Um, so you do have to have the whole constellation without the duration criteria. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, given that we have high comorbidity with ADHD, what do we think about the relationship between ADHD and depression, whether that's an early risk factor for depression, and what about early life adversity and its impact on risk for ADHD? So I think the latter is a really important question. We don't have the best sample to address that question because our sample is so enriched for depressive symptoms. So that tends to be the loudest signal in our sample. You could certainly look at that. I don't know that anybody has, um, but that would be a really interesting thing to look at, and I bet it would be there. Um, as far as ADHD leading to depression, I mean, we do know that kids who have ADHD at school age become impaired and often get secondary depression. I think that that's less of an effect in early childhood. Yeah. You talked about the late maturation of the brain in age. Yep. So I wonder if we have some hypotheses about that, that maybe the delay in brain maturation extends the vulnerability period or... Yeah. Well, Phil Shaw has lots of hypotheses about that, and he's written a couple of really powerful papers on it, sort of basically, you know saying kids who have ADHD have slower maturation of the cortex, which might explain why some people grow out of their ADHD. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really interesting new direction for conceptualizing ADHD. Yes? My question is related to the IFG question or misleading Yeah. Did you measure response inhibition or behavioral inhibitions? Do you think that could be to identify IFG Yeah, so we measure response inhibition using like the brief or parent-based report measures, but we don't have any performance measures of response inhibition. Um, actually, has a paper that she just submitted that is also looking at function of IFG, and we see alterations in function related to ACEs too, and connectivity. Yes. I mean, people have talked about that. I don't think it has a whole lot of traction. Um, I mean, of course, we talk about other inflammatory neuropsychiatric disorders, but depression, I don't think, is, is one of those. I, I, I see it more as sort of one of the underlying elements in, in the risk trajectory. Yes? Yes? 
that's captured in the ACEs variable, the trauma. But what early parental, like divorce, you mean? I mean, we measure that. Single parent, we measure that. Um, yeah, and we, we, we account for that. That's actually not a part of the ACEs variable, though. I didn't hear that. Yeah, adopted kids. Exactly. We might have a couple. I think we tried to screen them out, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yes? Yeah, this kind of relates to all this. Was there any subset of children that were trending one way that had an abrupt change, such as went to foster care or had separation from parents, incarceration of parents, and then saw the trend or the start to slow or speed up as they were shifted out of either low socioeconomic status or higher incidence? So, so we don't have enough kids who have those patterns to be able to address that question. I mean, the one study that informs that issue is the Bucharest Early Intervention Study that took kids who were reared in institutions, randomized some to therapeutic foster settings, also followed the kids in institutions, and then looked at variety of outcomes. That study, I think, basically showed the kids who were randomized to a nurturing environment before age two had the best outcomes, including cognitive outcomes. Yes? Thank you. Yes. Yes. At each trimester. Yeah. Um, we account for that, yeah. Because I think something that happens is that a lot of negative outcomes are on our side. That's true. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That is a real quagmire of the literature right now in terms of the effects of antidepressant on fetal outcomes. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, if the NIMH lets me, I plan to, yes. How, how old are your, is it cut right now? So now they're at, edging into late adolescence. Yeah, so we're getting close. Interesting. It's true. Yeah. Yes? It seems like there's a consistent trend that goes back to skills with God and power with monkeys and goes all the way through. How much of this do you think is that yeah, I think that probably plays a huge role. I mean, I really do. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't say how much, but that seems like the low-hanging mechanism by which a lot of these processes could be taking place. So, I mean, I do think that would be the single most important thing to focus on, for sure. I think the problem is that's a hard area methodologically to capture. So, it, it's, it's, unfortunately, we have some limitations there. Thank you so much. <clears throat>